Okay. The people I don't see here, I do not see Ryan or Amanda or Zach or Sally or Cassie, who just talked to me, or Jaron or Haley. No arguments there? Okay. We're going to review today for the exam. There won't be any clicker questions. And while you have the homework that's due tonight, there's no homework that's going to be due on Wednesday because we won't be doing any new material today. There's Sally. So the chapters that are going to be on the test are chapters 11 through 14 in their entirety. Now, we have the practice test questions on Moodle, and they're from the textbook I used last year. And on that textbook, chapters 11 and 12 in our textbook were chapter 9 in that textbook. And then 13 and 14 are the same. So it's just... Chapters 9, 13, and 14 from last year's textbook that will be covered on the exam. So, of course, 13 and 14 stay the same. All right, getting to our review material here. Zach Luke. I understand it was exciting. Night of football for your household, Zach. <laughs> Casual. <laughs> Casual, yeah. Okay, so chapter 11. Chapter 11, we looked at static fluids. Chapter 12 is dynamic fluids. So static fluids, stationary, dynamic, moving. You can see why the previous textbook combined those into one chapter that they just called fluids. So for static fluids, the first thing we have is making sure we understand what the phases of matter are and are able to differentiate them. So we have the three common phases of matter here, solid, liquid, and gas. And as we learned, we studied some in our Flip Friday. These aren't the only phases for matter. We also have the amorphous solid, or glass. Um, I, one person on the Flip Friday, by the way, I did spend three days of my vacation grading, but I have all the Flip Fridays graded and those should be recorded this afternoon. Um, but one person said that glass is transparent. Obsidian is a glass. And obsidian is not transparent. Everybody knows what obsidian looks like? It's black. It's very pretty. Um, glass simply means that it was frozen really rapidly so that it didn't form a crystalline structure. And so with rock, if you freeze the rock quickly, you form a glass. So the same chemical composition that would make basalt, if you freeze it really quickly, it makes obsidian. You freeze it more slowly and it starts to organize as it's freezing. That is, the atoms find positions of lower um, potential energy and fall into those positions and then you get small crystals that start forming and so if you look at basalt basalt has very small crystals you can feel it's rough if you slice it and look at it in a microscope you can see the crystals and if you cool it even more slowly the crystals just grow bigger and we tend to call that granite <laughs> So granite, basalt, obsidian. The difference is how quickly they froze. Okay, just had to clarify that because I thought it was interesting somebody said they're transparent. We think of glass as transparent because that glass in the window is transparent. And if, for people who care about window glass, there are hundreds of varieties of glass they use. You know, soda lime glass and this and that with different <laughs> compositions. <laughs> Of, of chemicals in them. Okay, so solid, liquid, and gas phase. Solid is typified by having a fixed volume and shape. 
And I will focus on crystalline solids here because they're the easiest ones to talk about. In a crystalline solid, every atom has a specific location. And the atoms can have little vibrations about that location, but they can't move to another location. Now, in amorphous solids, you know, it's a little bit different. But it's a fixed volume, a fixed shape. Each atom has its own location. A liquid, you have a fixed volume, but variable shape. Everybody got this right in the Flip Friday. And a gas, you have, it fills its container. So if you put two molecules in this room, they will fill the room. That is, they'll just move around anywhere in the room, and we would say the gas fills the room. Of course, two molecules would have a hard time calling that a gas. A gas usually have lots of molecules. So what makes the difference in these? I've spent a lot of time talking about these states of matter. Probably most people feel like I'm wasting time. But it's important to understand the difference is the forces between the molecules. When you have a low temperature, we learned, and it's coming up in the later chapter reviews, that temperature is a measurement that tells us about how much, well, I'm going to shift to a different term, how much internal energy the material has. The kinetic theory of gases was for ideal gases. And for ideal gases, what did temperature tell us specifically? About the what? Okay, it told us specifically about the average translational kinetic energy. So if we have an ideal gas, an ideal gas just has translational kinetic energy if it's monatomic. And so for an ideal gas, we can say it's the total internal energy if it's monatomic. That's if it has one atom. If it has two atoms, diatomic, it can have more kinds of energy than just translational. You can have rotation. If it's diatomic, you have something like this stylus. It can rotate about an axis like this, an axis perpendicular to it, so like this. It could, in theory, rotate about this axis, but there would be no kinetic energy there because kinetic energy for rotation was 1 half I omega squared. But what is the moment of inertia I for a straight line? Regardless of the mass, it's going to be zero because the distance away from the axis is zero. So you only have two rotational forms of kinetic energy. You also, for a diatomic molecule, it can go like this, right? We treat them in chemistry like you have a spring holding them together. It's more complicated than that, but we can treat them like they have a spring holding them together, and they can have energy stored in the spring and energy in their vibration. So there's an additional two forms of energy there. And so the total internal energy, you have to add all of those up. And when you add all of those up, it actually depends on your temperature. Quantum mechanics says that at low temperatures, a diatomic molecule can't rotate like this. It can't rotate at low temperatures. And it can't vibrate at low temperatures. So at really low temperatures, a diatomic molecule would behave like a monatomic ideal gas. Its total internal energy would just be the, well, 3 halves nkt. But if you heat it up, it can put energy into two more mechanisms. And a rule we'll learn in thermodynamics on Wednesday, I think it's Wednesday, maybe Friday, or yeah, maybe Friday, says that you put the same amount of energy in each way it can have energy. It's 1 half kT. So if you raise the temperature for a diatomic molecule, its total internal energy becomes 5 halves and kT. And if you make it even hotter, the last two mechanisms of having energy are available, and it goes to 7 halves nkt. So internal energy is related to temperature for sure, but the relationship depends on the state of the matter. So for a monatomic ideal gas, the internal energy was 3 halves nkt. And we're going to stick with that idea for now, but just you know, covering what these things mean. So at low temperature, Coming back to where this all started. At low temperature, what does that tell you about 
the kinetic energy of the molecules? It's slow. It's low kinetic energy. So if you have low kinetic energy, the molecules don't move that very far, and they can find positions that are stable. It's kind of like if you have a bunch of ping pong balls in a box, <laughs> which I had here, but I took it took and put back there. If you take the box and you gently vibrate it, they pretty much will stay in fixed positions as a crystalline solid would. But if I shake it too hard, they'll start to move past each other. And so what did I have to do to make them move past each other? I had to shake it harder, which would mean I gave them more kinetic energy, raised the temperature. And that's what happens when you go from a solid to a liquid. You make those molecules vibrate so hard that they actually break free of their fixed position and start moving past each other. So liquids are still held together, but you've made them so they have enough kinetic energy that they can actually move past each other, aren't stuck in one spot. So as we had on the Flip Friday, when you melt something, the energy went into breaking the bonds that were holding it in place, allowing them to move past each other. Then in the liquid form, you heat it up further and they just are going faster past each other until you get to high enough temperature that some of the molecules have a high enough kinetic energy to break away from the surface. Now, a very simple statistical question. Which ones have enough energy to break away from the surface? The ones that have the lowest kinetic energy or the highest kinetic energy? Highest, highest right? That was pretty obvious. But highest kinetic energy means that they have the highest temperature. So the highest temperature molecules are the ones that escape. So when you start having evaporation, it's the highest temperature, the hottest molecules that escape. So what happens to the average kinetic energy of what's remaining? It goes down, which means the temperature of what's remaining is lowered. So that's why evaporative cooling occurs, because it's only the fastest moving ones, the hottest molecules that are able to escape, leaving a lower average kinetic energy. So I have sweat on my skin. That sweat has some molecules that, you know, statistically, we looked at that Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, it doesn't go down to zero at high speed. So there's always going to be a few molecules that have a high enough kinetic energy to escape from the liquid on my skin. And when they leave, that leaves a cooler liquid behind. Well, if I have a cooler liquid sitting on my skin, what happens as far as heat? He has to go from my skin into the liquid, and when the heat flows out of my body, that's when I feel cold. I feel cold when heat leaves. And so I feel cold because heat had to go out of my body to warm that moisture on my skin back up to, room, or to body temperature. And if I have more evaporation, I'm going to have to have more heat flowing out. That's why you feel cool when you have a breeze blowing on you, because that breeze is taking away your evaporation, making the evaporation occur more rapidly, making your body have to keep that sweat heated up with more energy leaving the body. Now, I've covered ideas from the whole test here, right? The heat is from a later chapter. But want to understand the word I have here? Yeah, I have somewhere how it changes phase. Maybe some one of the next sections for a different chapter where I have that. Okay, so enough about the three states. Um, hydrostatic pressure. Very nice. I use the word hydrostatic here. What does static mean? It's what? Stationary, not changing. Hydro fluid. What's a fluid? Fluids are anything that flows, right? That's how we get the term fluid, things that flow. Gases and liquids both flow. A plasma not one of our three common phases, although some people would argue, no, it's really common. The sun is a plasma. Plasmas would also flow. But we usually just stick with liquids and gases. They flow, and we have a hydrostatic pressure in a stationary fluid, something that could flow but is not. Hydrostatic pressure is different from stress in that it's the same in all directions. Remember, stress, we had a compressive stress, a tensile stress, a shear stress. Hydrostatic pressure is the same in all directions, 
And if I have a fluid, let's say air, and that fluid has a pressure and it touches something, so I have air touching this desk, what direction is the force applied by the fluid on the desk? On the, on the top of the desk to make sure we're all on the same page. The force is always into the surface, directly into it. Not at an angle, but directly into it. So I have the air pressure in the room is pushing down on this desk. Air pressure is pushing down on me. I went through that when I lectured on this the first time. With the air pressure pushing down on me, why don't I sink into the floor? I have a force normal, but I also have air underneath me pushing me up. So like if I put my arms out, I have air pushing down on the top, air pushing up on the bottom, air pushing back on the front sides of my arms, air pushing forward on the back sides of my arms. It's pushing in all directions. And so if we take the area that air sees on this side of my arm, it'd be the same area as it sees on the other side of the arm. It's pushing forward and back with the same amount. I don't even notice it. It just keeps me from bloating, right? If we didn't have that air pressure, we'd all be bloated outward. Um, make sure we understand how pressure changes with depth. Now, later on, when we get to chapter 12, we'll have our Bernoulli equation, which incorporates this. But we started first with just how does pressure change with depth? Well, it's based on the weight of the stuff above. So if you go deeper, there's more stuff above, it weighs more. And we have the pressure increases by the density of the fluid times the height of the fluid times G. So make sure you can use that stuff. Pascal's principle, you increase the pressure in a constrained fluid here. It increases the pressure everywhere in the fluid by the same amount. And so we were able to use that in things like hydraulic lifts. Archimedes' principle had to do with buoyancy. Archimedes' principle, the first, first of the problems that I'll work out today is the Archimedes' principle problem. Archimedes' principle basically says that the upward force due to buoyancy is equal to the weight of the fluid that was displaced. And so make sure you can deal with those, deal with, is this going to float or sink? If it's floating, you know, what's the density? What type? I have two things of different density, like oil and water. One floats on the other. How do you relate density to which one floats? The less dense one, less dense one floats. And that's a result of Archimedes' principle. Finally, for chapter 11, make sure you understand how surface tension can explain why a water strider can walk on water, um, how surface tension explains what's going on with a meniscus in something like a water beaker. Okay, moving to chapter 12. Chapter 12 was fluids that were moving, and so we first have the flow rate. Now, everything we have done has been with incompressible fluids. I was looking at a pro uh, problem with Sade this morning, and it specified an incompressible fluid. Why does it say incompressible? Because that means that the density is not going to change. So, except for some very special cases where we use the bulk modulus, we're going to essentially say that we have incompressible fluids, the density doesn't change. In which case, the flow rate, the volume that passes per unit time, is just the area times the speed. Question? So, we shouldn't worry about problems like number eight on the chapter nine practice thing, where we're talking about a compressible fluid. Um, I, I would have to look at it. If it tells you what the density is here and what the density is here, then you can still do it. Okay, it does. Do we just use Bernoulli's Yeah, yeah. All, all that you do is you make sure you have the density and this portion matches what it is. But we're not going to have situations where you, you have to calculate, okay, so what's the density going to be here where density is a function of pressure and so you have two pressure terms that... Right, you have the pressure and the density is a function of pressure. We're not going to deal with that. Okay, make sure you can use Bernoulli's equation in all of its glorious details. You could have Bernoulli's equation in a situation where the pressure is the same in two locations, but you have different elevations and different speeds for the fluid. 
you could have it where you have everything different. There's all kinds of situations. So make sure you can apply Bernoulli's equation in all kinds of situations. And finally, differentiate between laminar flow. Laminar flow is smooth layers and turbulent flow. And let's make sure we understand how does it transition. We have this term viscosity. What does the viscosity tell you? It tells you about the internal friction of the fluid. If you have a viscosity of zero, there'd be no internal friction. That means the fluid can just flow right past other fluid without any relationship. We call that situation a superfluid. And you actually can have superfluid. Like you can get helium to form a superfluid. And when it forms a superfluid, you have really bizarre behaviors compared to what we're used to because of that lack of viscosity. I think I mentioned in class, you can have a filter that is so small, the porosity is so small that helium doesn't go through it. But when you get down to that superfluid transition, suddenly there is no connection between one helium atom and the next, and it just drains right through like there's nothing there. Really bizarre behavior. So that would be zero viscosity. As the viscosity gets larger, you have more resistance. So you can take your hand and you can sweep it through air. It goes pretty easily. It's not completely free. You're driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour, you put your hand out the window, it'll pull it back. Because there is some you know, viscosity in that air. There's also, I mean, you hold your hand like this, you've got a certain area it's hitting, but let's not worry about that. If you were to do the same thing in the swimming pool, go 60 or 80 miles an hour and drag your hand in the swimming pool, that would not be good. Right? Try dragging your hand at 5 miles per hour through molasses. Not very good. Why? Because I went through increasing viscosities. Motor oils in cars, viscosity is important. What's the purpose of a motor oil in a car? It's kind of important that people know this, no matter who you are. Okay, it's to reduce the friction between metal, because your car has metal sliding on metal. And when you have friction, you have things rubbing against each other. We'll learn real soon. That's doing work. And that's going to take energy of the motion and convert it into thermal energy, heating things up. And then the metal gets hot, and the hot metal expands. And when the hot metal expands, it can bind, and that's bad. So we have oil in there to keep them from having friction. So you want the oil to flow in between the things. What kind of viscosity do you want for the oil to flow in between the metal? High or low? Low. But you want it to stay in there and not be squished out easily. What kind of viscosity do you want for it to not be squished out easily? You want it to be higher. And so the viscosity is a very important aspect of motor oil. And so that's why we have things like 30 weight motor oil. That 30 weight is telling you its viscosity. If you have a 10 weight motor oil, it's a lower viscosity. It's going to more easily get in between things, but it's also going to be more easily squeezed out. And then, of course, you have a multi grade, a 10W30. It behaves as a 10 weight when it's cold, and it behaves as a 30 weight when it's hot, so that when you start up the engine, it quickly goes through the engine, and then it starts to thicken up once it's there. Okay. How does that relate to turbulence? Because we have an internal friction between the fluid, if I have this layer is going this speed and this layer is going faster, the friction between them will try to slow the faster one and speed up the slower one, and it causes them to start having turbulence if you have too big of a difference in speed. And it depends on your viscosity, hence you have the Reynolds numbers. Chapter 13, talking about temperature, kinetic theory, and the gas laws. So this is where we learn temperature is a measurement proportional to the average kinetic energy per molecule of an ideal gas. And we hopefully have a better understanding now. When we talk about thermodynamics, we have the zeroth law of thermodynamics that we'll learn for sure on Wednesday. That zeroth law says if temperature A is equal to temperature B, and temperature B is equal to temperature C, and temperature A is equal to temperature C. Or, putting that the way it logically rings in my head, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That seems really obvious, right? 
It seemed really obvious to scientists, too. They were, why would you ever say that? But then when they got further into thermodynamics and learned the idiosyncrasies of what's going on with temperature, and that it's not just, oh, this feels hot, this feels cold, then they realized that's not as obvious as it seemed. And so that's why it's called the zeroth law, because they'd already made the first and second laws. Now well, we need to come back and put this more fundamental law in here before the first and second. So there's more to temperature than there appears in the eye. Make sure you know the common units. For common units, I only mean Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. I do not mean Rankin or any of the other variations. Just in case somebody's like, well, you talked about Rankin. Yeah. Are we going to have to know how to switch back from all of Well, you'll have the equations, but you need to be able to use them. <clears throat> right? I don't care memorize how to, you know what the equation is. I care that you know how to use it. Okay. Properties of ideal gases. The two properties we learned about, they have just purely elastic collisions when they collide. They don't have any reaction if they don't collide. And that their volume is so small that they never collide. Now, of course, it's not possible to actually have a volume so small that they never collide. But if we have a low particle density, low number of particles per unit volume, then the probability of them colliding becomes very small. And so that's leading to ideal behavior. If they're going really fast, then the amount of time when they're close enough for any interaction to occur is really small. So you treat them like they pass by each other without interacting. And when they hit, any energy lost in that collision would be small compared to their kinetic energy, so it would be essentially elastic. So that's how high temperature and low particle density give us ideal behavior. So clearly, if you're close to liquefaction, that means close to the condensation temperature, where the molecules will come and stick together, well, that's not ideal. If you're really high density, like say in the core of the sun where we have hydrogen fusing into helium at a temperature of 15 million kelvins, 15 million kelvins is high. You might say, oh, well, that, we got high temperature. That's what the book said we needed, right? The book just gave us that one condition. That's not enough. You also have to have the low particle density. And in the core, it's a very high particle density, not an ideal gas. Okay, the ideal gas law, I presume that everybody has a lot of familiarity with it and don't spend a lot of time with it. But you need to make sure you can solve simple problems with the ideal gas law. It's going to become more important. <laughs> scared me, Michaela. I saw you put something away. I was like, did I use up all my time? <laughs> uh, it's going to become more important as we talk about thermodynamics this coming week. Um, we're a little behind. We'll talk about thermodynamics for about a week, and then we'll talk about sound for about a week. Then, then we'll go home for Christmas break. Get to watch two Raider games. <laughs> um, okay. And I've already talked about this last one. Let's go on to the final chapter before I go to problems. So the final chapter, heat and heat transfer. Make sure you know the three mechanisms of heat and the factors that affect them. So very quickly, uh, Austin, what is one mechanism for heat? No, the three ways that you can have heat flow. Actually, before he answers, let me make sure I clarify one thing. Heat is a transfer process of energy. It is a transfer process that doesn't involve work. So thermodynamics, starting on Wednesday, we'll be talking about two transfer processes, heat and work. So heat is the one without work. So we have three mechanisms where we can have heat. One of them, I believe you came up and grabbed a piece of metal, didn't you? What were we looking at there? Uh, that was, that was transferred. I don't know. I'm transferred through what? Through the metal. Okay, it was transferred through contact, and we call it conduction when they're transferred through contact. So that's one mechanism. He transferred through contact. Did you want to answer, Michaela? Um, okay, convection is another one. And how does convection occur? <laughs> he is so ready. Okay. He transferred a macroscopic movement. We had in our Flip Friday a cup of water, and you had to analyze the three mechanisms. What's the third one? Um, yeah, go ahead, Alexis. Radiation. 
Radiation. And what is radiation? It's just uh, the thermal energy coming off of our bodies. Like through, through what, through what, though? Through waves. Waves, yeah. waves. Electromagnetic waves. OK, so we have to look at that cup of water and say, what's going to be effective or ineffective for having a glass tumbler sitting on a wood desk? And so you have conduction. Well, I have to have the heat go through the glass and through the wood. Both of those are pretty poor conductors. So that means conduction would be a minimal concern for heat loss from that tumbler. Then we have convection. Convection is the flow of a macroscopic molecule. Air is the most common one we worry about because we live in a world of air. If we were in the ocean, we worry about convection from water. In the sun, convection from protons. So we have air. That cup is surrounded by air, and air has direct access to the water. So convection is actually going to be pretty strong for that cup losing heat. Then we have radiation. Radiation has to do with either absorbing or emitting rays of light. You absorb waves of light, or you emit them. Now I'm saying light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. So radiation it has to be something that would absorb or emit. If it absorbs well, it also emits well. Well, light goes right through a glass and right through water. It doesn't absorb it very well. Hence, it doesn't emit radiation very well either. So it's not going to lose energy effectively through radiation. Our tabletop is black. It'll absorb light real well. Thus, it will also emit light real well. If I had you know, a black rock, then radiation would have been a much more significant factor. So make sure you understand those three mechanisms and the aspects that affect them. Ah, and then we have calorimetry problems. Calorimetry problems are the ones that relate heat flow with change in temperature or change in phase. So we have for calorimetry two basic equations. Q equals mc delta t or Q is equal to ml. In the first one, what does M stand for? The mass of my object. What is C? It's the specific heat. Or if you want to be really technical, it's the specific heat capacity. Heat capacity is one thing. Specific heat is the heat capacity divided by mass. That's the one we always work with. And we usually drop off the word capacity just because we don't want to say three words. So as long as we say specific heat, we're good. And then delta T is the temperature change that it goes through. Now the second one, what is the M? Not the mass of the object. I think everyone said the mass of the object on Flip Friday. Oh, the mass of the amount of the object that is changing phase. Yes, it's the only the mass that changes phase. Right, you put an ice cube in water, if that water stays at zero, only some of the ice cube presumably will have melted. And so the M is the amount that melted, not the total mass of the ice cube. It's very important to have that distinction in your head because very often you will have a question that's something on the order of, so I have T and I put ice in, and how much of the ice melts? Well, then I'm going to use that equation because the M of that equation is going to be how much of the ice melts. Now with the calorimetry, you make yourself a calorimeter. I had a nice long paragraph in Flip Friday describing the calorimeters. What's the goal of a calorimeter? Just to insulate it from the outside so you don't have heat loss of the environment. To insulate it so you don't have heat loss. So you want to insulate against radiation. You insulate against radiation by having like a silver container. Silver because it reflects electromagnetic radiation. Doesn't absorb it, doesn't emit it, just reflects it. You have usually a double wall, well, for calorimeter they don't do this because double wall glass is just going to break. But for a thermos, which is a brand name for a type of doer, but for a doer, you have a double wall glass. Why double wall? Because they put a vacuum in between. You have no convection if there's a vacuum, right? Because there's no macromolecules to move around and carry the heat. So they have vacuum between the walls. Double walls are made of glass because glass is a pretty good insulator. Thin glass, because the rate at which heat travels through conduction 
is proportional to the area, the cross-sectional area. So if it has to go up the glass and down the other side, the thinner it is, the smaller the area. Long length, finally they put a cap on the block convection. They do all these things to try to limit the amount of heat. Now the actual calorimeters we use in physics labs are just aluminum cups. <laughs> they might be silvered so they reflect. You have one cup inside another cup with air in between them because it's really not convenient for us to make them in vacuum in between. If you take um, PCHEM2, you'll do some experiments with a bomb calorimeter. Have you guys heard the term bomb calorimeter? Some have. Why is it called a bomb calorimeter? Yeah, because you make a, an explosion inside of it. Now, I say an explosion inside. Explosion just means very rapid combustion. You put something in there that can burn. You put a filament to start the fire, and it burns. You put it in water, and you measure the temperature change in the water. The water itself is, well, just like you do in any calorimeter problem, you measure the change in temperature of the water. You know how much heat flowed out of your little bomb into the water and they know how much heat was released in the burning of whatever you had inside. And that's how they determine how many calories are in a piece of cake. Which always disturbs me because I can take a piece of wood, and if I put that wood in the bomb calorimeter, or, or cotton, right? Put some cotton in the bomb calorimeter, put a 100% oxygen environment, put my little filament, put a little arc in there, that cotton's gonna burn. It's gonna produce a lot of heat. That doesn't mean that I'm going to gain weight by eating cotton, right? Because it's what? Cellulose. What is it? Chitin. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about biology is the honest truth. Um, but it's, it's stuff that our body, it's proteins that our body can't absorb and thus. <laughs> They're great for food. You put it in the food and it's filler because <laughs> you don't absorb any calories from it. Okay, moving on then. Let's look at some problems. Actually, any questions before I start looking at solving problems? And these are all homework problems that have the lowest scores. No questions? Okay, first question here, homework problem. We have a hydrometer with a density of 0 0.750 grams per milliliter that's floating in some unknown fluid with 92% of the hydrometer submerged. And I'm asked to find the density of the fluid. If this is a test question, what's the very first thing you do? You draw a diagram. So I start by drawing a diagram. And so my diagram, here's a cup. That cup is filled with the fluid. Here's the fluid. And in that I put my hydrometer. You might remember me playing around with some hydrometers here in class. And that hydrometer has 92% submerged. And there's my picture. What's the next thing you do if it's on the test? Concepts. Concept. So what concept is involved here? Okay. She said buoyancy. Specifically... Archimedes principle. That says the volume displaced has weight equal to weight of object. Now you might ask, why did I say that's Archimedes principle? Well, if it's floating, well, yeah, that's always Archimedes principle. If it's floating, I can use this in a simple way. If it's not floating, I need more. So this is floating. I have my concept. So now let's go to our equations. What's my equation going to be here? Okay, let's start simple. Force of gravity is equal to mg 
And for something that I know its density, I can relate that by the density times the volume times G. Now that's a general equation for the weight. So I'm going to have now my second equation, the force of gravity for the displaced is equal to the force of gravity for the object. And so now let's do some work. Force of gravity displaced, substituting in that force of gravity equation, that's going to be the density of my fluid, because the fluid's what's displaced, multiplied by the volume displaced, multiplied by G, is equal to the density of my object, multiplied by the volume of my object, multiplied by G. So there I just did the fluid that's displaced on one side and the object on the other side. There's one thing I can do here before I do anything tricky. What's the one thing I can do right now? I can cancel out the G's. No reason to carry those around. And so I can right away say, well, the density of my fluid must be equal to the density of my object times the volume of the object divided by the volume displaced. And now I look back at the problem. It says 92% submerged. What does that tell us about the volume displaced? So what? Okay, so I ran out of space because that's what planning does for you. Therefore, volume displaced is equal to 0 0.92 volume of object. I don't like to just choose a random number. I like to use a random symbol because if the symbol disappears, I know it didn't cause a problem. If the symbol stays, then I'm like, rut row. Apparently, I changed my answer by choosing this random number. So putting that in, the density of my object, 0 0.750, and it was grams per milliliter. Volume of the object divided by 0.92 times the volume of the object. And we see, hooray, the volume of the object does indeed cancel. And so we're left with the density of the fluid is equal to that 0 0.750 grams per milliliter divided by 0.92. And since I see people busily with the calculator, what is that number? Grams per milliliter. Now the problem specifically asked for it to be kilograms per cubic meter. This isn't the right units, is it? I do not throw up my arms and say, I can't do this. I say, I need to convert units. And I know that a, millime a milliliter is the same as a centimeter cubed. So this is equal to 0 0.815 grams per centimeter cubed. And now that I have that, I can do my conversions. Hmm, one kilogram per 10 to the third grams and 100 centimeters per meter. That would take care of one centimeter. How many centimeters do I have? Three, it's cubed, so I have to cube this. And so this is 10 to the second cubed is 10 to the sixth. 10 to the sixth divided by 10 to the third is 10 to the third. And so I just multiply by 1,000 equals 815 kilograms per meter cubed. It's always good to brush up on the unit conversions here. I didn't just stop there because I want people to remember how to do them and not just forget that units are important. Also, significant digits are important. I took off a number of points on the flip price because people were putting lots of digits. If you had more than one digit off of the correct significant digits, they start taking off points. So, any questions about how this problem worked? Nope. Going on to the next one. The pitot tube, which was, well, 
The picture was already given. And so in this case, I'd say no additional figure needed because there really is no addition to make on this. If I say that you need to make a modification, make sure you think about now what modification do I need. But on this one, there isn't any modification necessary. So we got the figure already taken care of. What would my next step be for this problem? It's asking about what the pressure is at this speed. What's our principle? What's our concept? It's what? It's going to be Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation, you're relating the pressure, the velocity, and the height. And so <clears throat> we have here a pressure, gives me a pressure reading of 16 millimeters of mercury at a speed, the velocity, and it tells us that we're going to be at the same altitude, so our heights are going to be the same. So whenever I do a Bernoulli's equation problem, I'm of course going to have my, I didn't write down concept, but I wrote the, word, or the answer there. For my equation, pressure one plus, I always do the same order, one half rho v1 squared plus rho g h1 equals pressure two plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho g h2. Now the problem tells us that we're going to be at the same altitude. So I'm not going to have to worry about the heights. And so I'm just going to use this to say that these two subtract out. Leaving me with that relationship. And then it furthermore tells me that V1 was zero. And so, well, I've started work, haven't I? I need to be more clear. I started work as soon as I started modifying that equation. <laughs> work. P1 equals P2 plus one half rho V2 squared. Yes? Where are we getting the V1 is zero? Um, it tells us, it says right here, V1 is zero. Then what is that 2.5 kilometers per hour? That's the V2. Then what's the 695 kilometers per hour? That's a second V2, because we have two situations. And I think that's where people had difficulty with this problem, was because we had two situations that we had to relate. So we had situation one, or maybe I'll call it situation A. VA is equal to, in this case, 225 kilometers per hour. And P2A is equal to 16 millimeters of mercury. So that was my situation A. I had then situation B. VB, whoops, lowercase, is equal to 695 kilometers per hour, and P2B is what I'm looking for. So if I look at my equation here, it has variables P1, P2, and V. And if you look at the numbers I have in the situations, I only have V and P2. So how can I solve this? Solve for P1 and then yeah, take situation 1 to solve for P1, and then put that into situation 2. So from situation 1, I get that P1 is equal to 
16 millimeters of mercury plus one half the density of air times VA squared. Now I've got some unit issues here, don't I? But I can deal with units. So I come down to situation B and solving that for P2, P2B is equal to P1 minus, that's not, one half density of air V B squared. And so then I put this P1 in And then, of course, that's going to be 16 millimeters of mercury plus one-half the density of air, which it tells me is 1.29 kilograms per meter cubed times VA squared. And if you do it the way I'm writing right now, you're going to find a lot more angst than you really want. Why would I say that you would find, this is correct, it's all correct. Why would I say you'd find a lot more angst than you want if you do it the way that I just wrote it? My units are all over the road. And you have to go through and convert those units so that you get your final answer in millimeters of mercury again. And so we're out of time. I won't go through and correct the units. But what I would do is say, well, Pressure 2B is a height in millimeters times G times the density of mercury and divide across and make sure I change from kilometers per hour to meters per second and then I'd be good to go. Okay, I'll see you, well, some of you I'll see Tuesday morning, everybody I'll see Tuesday afternoon.